So welcome to exam two review. I'm going to share a PowerPoint, go over, try to hit those key concepts that you need to understand. Remember, it's not the memorization you have to understand. How do you use the information that I'm sharing with you? Okay, that's the key thing. And I try to describe that as I'm going through. So here we go. All right, weeks four, five, and six. So this week we're getting the rest of our information. Now we always put a preempt in the beginning. Just remember, um, if you all want to be on campus, do an exam there. Your person on campus has to email the professor two days prior, and we can give that okay. Also, remember to return to your class for the scheduled class after exams. That's your attendance. You don't come back to class, you get no attendance that week. And we know we're looking at attendance really, really closely. So let's look at some cognitive sensory impairment. Well, sensory, let's look at vision. Now there's a couple different vision things that we look at. Now, amblopia is basically a lazy eye. Just like that little eye there is crooked going the wrong way, it's because the muscles are weak and they don't wanna work. Well, how do you strengthen a muscle? You make it work, right? You do exercise. Well, cover the good eye and let that bad eye start working and it will strengthen those muscles, okay? That's all you need to do. And we take them off and on for, maybe it's on for two hours, off for an hour during the day, whatever the physician says, but some sort of program like that. Now, strabismus is when you're looking ahead and each eye works independently. So they cross to try to see it. So you're always confused. So you have no depth perception. Again, this is something to do with muscles. Usually they'll do strengthening exercises to correct this. You know, and the other one um, that we do here is also called nystismus when it's uh, back and forth, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. But strabismus is when, you know, it's like being an infant. You have binocularity where one eye and one other eye work, but they don't work together. Same thing. And that's what this focus thing is trying to do. Okay, cognitive impairment. What do you see? Well, initially you might see that the child doesn't look normal. It could look like a down child, the big tongue, the um, almond eyes, um, that flat nose bridge, you know, and downs. You might see that. But what you're going to mostly see could be a normal looking child, normal looking adult, um, infant. And you're going to see gross and fine motor delays. That is a big thing that you see. You're not going to be able to walk by a year old and take some steps. Um, maybe it's 18 months, two years old when they're starting to walk. Fine motor. They're not able to build blocks until they're well into two, or maybe put things into containers, or even use that pincer grasp very finely. The other thing is language problems. Most infants can say mama, dada, and hopefully nana by age one. If they're not talking, and they're not talking more than two words by two years old, something's going on. And they are delayed because they should be able to communicate. Now, because they're unable to communicate, make their things known, they're going to have behavior difficulties. They're upset. They want to express themselves. I can't. I'm upset. I have behavior problems. So you're going to see them sometimes sitting in the corner. They're, they're not paying attention. You call their name, they're not going to look at you. You'll see that gross, fine motor delays, language will be down, and of course, those behaviors. The milestones, those are all those fine gross motor delays that you see. As I was mentioning, cognitive delays, you think of Down syndrome. And remember, they're on all levels of the spectrum, from very mild to very severe. The one thing about Down's children, they have a higher incidence of congenital heart defects. I mean, we can say they're short, stubby fingers and toes, and we see this big tongue and almond eyes. They're also very floppy. They could take both feet, put them over their head, 
is part of it. Um, they've got um, those, the way their hands are, you'll see these big thumbs with the fingers. And then of course, the seeming increase that you'll see on their palms of their hands and on their feet. <clears throat> One of the things very specific to Downs is this underdeveloped nasal bone. And what happens because of that, and maybe because of the, all the other airway, big tongue thing, they have a lot of upper respiratory infections, but it's mainly because that nasal bone is flat and mucus sits there and it drips and it causes this upper respiratory up into the ear infections. So it's the nasal bone causing it. Now, cognitive delayed children, Down's children, doesn't matter. These children are really going to have high anxiety. They do not want to be separated from their parents. So one of the key things that we as nurses need to do is try to keep our kids with their parents, okay? We, um, big thing, that is one of the biggest common things. Let them stay with them, you know, give them their blankets, their pillows, let them stay next to them. These kids do much better. Now, these are part of those verbal things I was just starting to talk about. You know, they, initially they go coo and they cry because crying calls that nurse over to that person. Um, by the time uh, 10 months old, they are going no. Of course, by 10, 12 months, they, they should be saying mama, dada, and of course, nana. And then by one year old, you're going to hear different things coming out. They're going to maybe want milk. Maybe they want their juice. Maybe they want something. And they'll be able to express those things. Now, in any sort of cognitive child, when you hear that they're not speaking in a clear way, always check for hearing problems because you have to hear in order to speak. So those are always interconnected. Now, autism, part of your cognitive delayed type thing, you're gonna have a child who is sitting in the corner not responding to their name. They're not doing what the other kids are you're doing. They just don't know how to, you know, do the play the other kid's doing. Another thing is they do this unusual repetitive behavior. You know, one of the kids that I met in uh, a day uh, daycare when I was doing clinicals, it was a specialized daycare. This kid was a, a very much a uh, autistic child, but he was Down's autistic, so double whammy. This kid would take a, a toy, put it on a chair, take something else, put it on top of it, take a paper, put it on top of it, and put a block on. Take the block off, paper off, toy off, the um, truck off, put it on the floor, and repeat, repeat, repeat over and over and over again. And he was very happy doing that. Now the kid couldn't speak, he would more like grunt or he would point to stuff that he needs, would not play with other kids. They do not like to play with other kids. They don't like noise, they don't like sound. They do not like to be touched, okay? And this is part of spectrum of, of autism. We usually do not diagnose these till after two years old. Okay, immunizations, we're giving a lot to a lot of children, two, four, six months, 12 months, 15, 18 months, two years. I mean, we're giving a whole bunch because we're trying to build up the child's immune system. Now, there are times when vaccines should not be given. Now, it could be a child immunosuppressed, maybe their sickle cell, maybe they on steroids causes immunosuppression, or it could be cancer and they're on chemo. They don't have a white count, right? So they should not be given any live vaccines, okay? Now, families whatnot can give it and get it, but these children cannot because they can't fight with it because they're so immunosuppressed. Now, you're gonna see all different things with vaccines. Now, we think all children get it. We think all children are born and the first vaccine we give is the hep B at the hospital, usually before they leave. Well, not all of them do. I have seen many different reasons. Sometimes I've heard personal beliefs, religious beliefs. Maybe they want more information before they decide it, you know. But um, remember, if a kid is not immunized, you as a nurse 
make sure that you're careful. A kid who comes in not immunized with a respiratory illness with a fever better put a mask on because who's not to say that's not something like pertussis because it's out there because of that. Now, you have infants that do require a long-term stay in a hospital due to many different reasons. And, you know, we have to think not just the elderly that we need to do, you know, uh, skin care and preventing pulmonary complications. We need to do these for children. So number one, always in cognitive delays, uh, children who are long term uh, ill is nutrition because the body needs the food and the nutrients to be able to um, fight infection or whatever. So that's one. Also, just like adults, we're gonna use a draw sheet. Even the little infants will pull them up that way because their skin could slide and come off, just like adults. Now, because they're kids, they don't have stronger skin. Of course, skin moisturizers, and then some sort of moisture reduction pad or diapers, chucks, whatever keep them dry. Make sure we turn them just like we do adults, right? I prop them up with their toys and their blankets and all sorts of things so they will not fall back. Pillows um, and blankets, you know, all these things I'm going to use to help keep them turned over. And then of course you have those wonderful beds. Yeah, definitely use them because Children can't get ulcers. They can get decubitus ulcers. They can get foot drop. They can get all of those things. So just like adults, we're going to take care of them. So how are you going to do a good assessment on any child? Well, you know, when you're talking younger kids, younger kids, they're very afraid of strangers. They're not going to go to people easily. You know, it's, uh, they're just afraid. You know, as a uh, stranger danger, as I call it. So have them sit on the mother's lap. I mean, where do you feel more comfortable as a child? In the lap of your mother. And you could do so many things there. And of course, incorporate play, play into that. Now, we talked a little bit about play with the first exam. But the one thing about play and being in the hospital, we use that so they can express themselves, okay? So sometimes we let them get the anger out. They're angry being in the hospital, expressive play. But dramatic play is really going to tell me what happened in a hospital that they liked or didn't like so that I can help maybe turn that around. So dramatic play is about a hospital experience and we can figure out so that we don't do that again. And then, of course, creative play lets them draw about what they're feeling. Um, and it's another good thing, another distractive thing, too. Now, pain, pain in children. You know, it used to be, ah, children don't have pain. Infants don't have pain. Well, let me tell you, they do. They are a person and they all get pain. So if a child's in pain, they're going to act just like an adult. They just had, a, let's say, um, a ruptured appendix and they, their tummy hurts a lot. And you want them to cough and deep breathe and get out of bed and using septic spirometry, you know something, they're not going to do it. Medicate them for pain first. Let it work. Then do some sort of distraction. Maybe you have them stand up and dance to some music. You turn on the radio. You are doing the exercises, respiratory care they need, and they don't realize they're doing it and you've taken care of that pain first, okay? So once you medicate them, they're gonna be able to do a lot more. You know, use that instead of spirometry. And of course, if it's abdominal surgery, get a pillow, it feels better. Remember, it's just not giving that morphine or Dilaudid or any of those type of medications. Remember also to utilize acetaminophen or ibuprofen for children over six months. And never, ever use aspirin unless it's Kawasaki disease, right? Kawasaki is the one. IV assessment, always check it, look at it. If you see it swollen, something's happening, number one, you know, get it out and put a warm pack on that. That's hospital approved warm pack. Uh, put it on there and um, restart the IV if needed.
we do have gastrostomy tubes in children. There's some children with the little jaws and some diagnoses, Pierre Robin and DeGeorge syndrome. We haven't gone over them yet. And we really don't because there's just too many syndromes for us to go over the many, but they have a lot of difficulties with um, eating. Um, it's hard for them to take food in their mouth and um, suck and swallow and breathe even when they're infants. So they put in gastrostomy tubes. Remember, there's all types, just like there is with the adult world. Only just clean it with soap and water once a day is all it needs today. Um, and just replace that little gauze if mostly, um, if it's a newer one, we'll stick those back in there. We do give children oxygen. They don't always run good saturations. I mean, premature infants are born, their lungs don't work, they're intubated for, you know, two, three months, depending. And as we get them off that, that intubated, that endotracheal tube, which is really hard to tolerate, we're gonna put them on usually a little oxy hood. And they can look around, see the world, they can suck their fingers or a pacifier. It is the best tolerated for the young, young infants, okay? Maybe a two-year-old, a toddler, maybe a nasal cannula because they're not gonna sit underneath a plastic hood, but infants, it's that oxy hood. And this shows you we can give up to 60% depending on how much liters we're throwing in there. Now, infants, um, many times they come up with urinary tract infections. And remember, infants do not have a great immune system. So the best and most accurate way to do a urine specimen is a catheterized urine specimen. Most parents will say, can't you just bag the child? I'm like, sure, I could bag the child, put it on, you're gonna get some skin um, contamination and it's not gonna be an accurate culture and sensitivity. And it could mean that your child's gonna be on several different doses of antibiotics. Let's do this quick, get it in once, get the specimen, a sterile specimen, and now we can treat it one time. And because remember, some infants, they don't have that fight to do it more than once. Uh, a lot of times, you know, these things, by the time they cry, it's, it's because we've held them down, not because of the pain of the whole procedure. You know, they say you can use lidocaine jelly. Honestly, in my career, I've never used it. I just use plenty of lubrication. Make sure somebody's holding that infant well. The mother's up by the head talking to them, sucking on that nice little pacifier. And I go, boom, get it in, out, and it's done. They don't even know what happens. So even all older kids, it's not that horrible of a procedure. Now getting infant labs, what the great thing is you don't have to go and stick them into their antecube. The only time you do blood in an antecube if you want like big amount of tubes of blood for whatever reason, um, but only your coags, your PT, PTT has to be with a blood stick, a venous stick. Every other blood, the Joxin levels, um, all of your electrolytes, your CBC is uh, done on the heel. Make sure that we only use the um, newborn little lancet. We don't want it too deep because it can go deep and actually hit a bone cause osteomyelitis. So very easily with that little lancet, but use a hospital approved heel warmer. Don't go try to find a washcloth and heat it up in water or microwave. You'll burn the kid. These kids are very sensitive. So only that infant heel warmer should be used. And if you hold that foot down, squeeze it slowly. A CBC is only 0.4 mLs. And a CBC and a complete chem profile is only 1.2 mLs. So it's not a lot of blood that's required. Intake output, what do you count? Well, anything in, you can count that in. Output, you can actually go to the point of uh, monitoring sweat. And you're like, well, how do you monitor sweat? Well, you put maybe a big diaper underneath them. And you know if the diaper way dry, if they're sweating, you can actually get a count from that. I've never had to do it. I've never gone to that extreme, but the book says, you know, you can, but that's how I would do it. So giving medications to your child. Now, many of kids don't really want it. 
And you know, what I have learned is number one, you need to go in with a firm approach. Um, the older kids, do you want liquid do you, or do you want a pill? Would you like it in a spoon, a syringe or a cup? You know, that's the only choice is just, just a direct approach, that's it. Now, younger kids will get it in their mouth and they're gonna wanna spit it out. If a parent takes the deep breath in and quickly in their face, it scares them or shocks them and they swallow. And that's how you get the um, medicine down a child who doesn't want to swallow it. Now, in a hospital, you know, I've already mentioned it about letting a parent stay there. That separation anxiety is huge, especially in your younger kids. But you know, even adolescents want mom and dad. I mean, they usually want their buddies, right? They, they want their peers, but if they're sick in a hospital, they do want mom and dad there. So remember, keeping those parents with the children as much as we can is absolutely uh, what we have to do. Now, when you get into a hospital, we know these kids are going to be angry. You know, they're gonna go through, you know, the, the degree of separation anxiety, right? They're going to all of a sudden regress if they start the crying and the screaming. We've talked about that. And then it goes to the point where they regress, where they're sucking their finger again, or they want a sippy cup, not a regular cup, or they start, you know, being, um, they're not potty trained anymore. So you're going to see all of these stages in children. Remember, it's because they're angry because they want their mom there. They want the attention. So trying to keep same nurses in there, trying when you can to sit with these kids that are alone really is important. And, you know, I like to play, so I used to always do those things. We know as a kid gets older, getting on their developmental level, talking to them, making it a game, and then letting them touch the equipment is a great thing. You know, toddlers, preschoolers are both separation from, from parents again, big, big thing. But, you know, if you let these kids play with this stuff, they're gonna wanna help you because preschoolers are helpers. Now, school age children, now they're older and they're more aware of their surroundings. They really want to try to keep them on the same routines. Like if they take their bath in the morning, let them do it in the morning. If they're used to it at night, let them do it at night. Um, if we can, try to keep them on the same foods. If they want to, you know, get different clothes on for the day, that's fine, as long as it doesn't interfere with their medical care. So try to work around what is their routine at home. So we know that safety is all about the nurse and making sure that that patient is safe. It's not the parent's responsibility. So we need to, as nurses, make sure that we're describing, make sure you put the side rail up before you leave. Or if you have to go downstairs, put the call bell next to them or let me know before you go. All of these things are important um, that these children to keep them safe. Now, chronic otitis media, inner ear infection. Well, it could get like that ear on top and it can pop and get all of the pus and zero sanguineous, you know, draining. That can happen, okay? Now, at that point, probably your pain is, you know, decreased uh, exponentially, but ear aches hurt. So your, your first priority on these kids, take care of that pain. So pain medicine, and it's Tylenol or Motrin. You know, I've always said, I like that ibuprofen. I like the anti-inflammatory in it. But, you know, acetaminophen works just as well. So make sure you address that pain because then by the time the doctor comes in, he'll be able to look in the ear and do a better evaluation. That ear hurts, you know, kid's not gonna let you anywhere near it. So again, pain control, so important. Now, bronchitis is an infection that you are going to see a non-productive dry hacking cough worse at night, you know, and it keeps them awake all night long. You may or may not see a fever, and these children will end up getting some sort of cough medicine to try to calm them down. 
you let them sleep at night. If you're an adult, they'll try to give you a narcotic cough medicine, if you can find them. Now, croup. Karoop is, you know, you can also call it a laryngotracheal bronchitis, okay? So if you see that, it's not bronchitis. It's all laryngeal tracheals, all in the upper airway. And croup is this barking like a seal type of um, cough. You can hear this from across an entire busy ER. That kid is a croup. So... It's a virus. There's really not any antibiotic because that's not what it is. It's an inflammation of the laryngotracheal bronchus. So we need to give these children some sort of steroid to stop the swelling. Croup is inspiratory strider. That means getting air in because that larynx is just so swollen, you can't get air in. Conversely, asthma is expiratory strider. That's the difference between croup and your asthma. Okay, cystic fibrosis. We know that two parents can have the gene and we know that 25% of these children or one out of four will have cystic fibrosis itself. Many times, Cystic fibrosis is diagnosed at birth when they don't have a stool within the first two days of life. They're going to say, hmm, there's a couple more things that we'll look at, which we're going to study in week eight. But just know that cystic fibrosis, if we're suspecting it, they're not stooling it. They're going to be doing a test for it. Now, cystic fibrosis, you ooze salt out of your pores. I've told my students, if you tell that parent to lick that child, it's going to taste salty. So they're losing salt. So never, ever decrease the salt in this child's diet. They're losing it themselves. And the test that they use to determine cystic fibrosis is called a sweat chloride test. So you know have a sweat chloride test. You have cystic fibrosis. You know, what do we do? Well, we're going to be seeing some things, you know, with these children. Now, cystic fibrosis is an extra clog of mucus in the lungs and in the small intestines. And it has to do with nutrition and the ability to take nutrition and to absorb it and use it for the body. The lungs is just mucus building up. It's like a big Petri dish, I call it, that just loves to collect all sorts of bacteria. So. What are you going to see with these children? Well, because of the dietary, you're going to have these large, bulky, um, unbelievably foul smelling stools. I mean, it's horrific. Now, you do not absorb fat. So you don't absorb fat. You don't absorb any of the fat vitamins, A, D, E, and K. You don't absorb them. They're gone. Also, because you're not absorbing foods, you're losing foods, you're going to see weight loss. Now, your lungs, they're always going to sound like they're sick, wheezing, dyspnea. You're going to have this dry, non-productive cough. And as I said, there are petri dishes for infection, and they are chronically getting infected. So, as I said, these kids need their salt. Okay, so give them whatever they want. They need high calorie diet and they need protein in their diet because they're losing fat, okay? So, I mean, you can give them supplements all you need and we're gonna be given, um, I believe it's the next slide, tell you we're gonna be giving something to help them absorb their food called pancreatase. Now, lungs. The most aggressive physical therapy you're ever going to do is on a cystic fibrosis child. You're going to put them in those little vests that are going to be buzzing at least twice a day. They say before every meal you should, and they should expectorate the mucus before. A postural drainage, chest PT, all sorts of aerosols, even antibiotics and aerosols like uh, gentamicin, tobramycin, very, very common in these children. So the best way you can prolong life is a double lung transplant, okay? But until they get to that point, we need to be able to give them their nutrition. Because remember, as I say, 
Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. If you don't have nutrition, the kids don't grow and their brains aren't going to work right. So we're going to give them pancreatic enzymes 30 minutes before meals and snacks. And this helps. Is it me or is she frozen no, for everyone? Some warnings about it. It's across the board. You froze. You, you froze. You froze. I froze. Where did I yes. freeze? Where did I freeze? Pancreatic, pancreatic enzymes. Mm -hmm. That you give 30 minutes. Okay. So we're going to give it 30 minutes before meals and snacks. So do not, these enzymes, sometimes they come in enteric coated beads. They should never be chewed or crushed, just like anything in your medicines. Anything enteric coated, leave it like that. Now you can put the sprinkling over the food or there's powder you can put over the food. Just make sure you rinse the mouth when they're done because it can irritate the inside of the mouth. And the one thing that we forget to do in all medicine is to increase the amount of medicines um, as the kids grow. Because kids get bigger, are we increasing the doses as they need it? As yes. I said, best outcome is double lung transplant. Now, if a male wants to have a baby, they can have one after a double lung transplant. Apparently, there's something with their vas deferens and it doesn't have the ability to release sperm before this double transplant. The whole mechanism, I'm not sure. But what happens is one year post drug transplant, their chances to have offspring increase because before that, they're sterile. They can have no children. So that's the one big thing about CF is that double lung transplant. And it's a great commitment to do that you know, to get new lungs. Okay, tonsillectomy. You know, it's no big deal, right? You go into the hospital, they take them out and they send home right away. Well, you know, let's teach the parents how to take care of these kids at home. Once they get home, nothing irritating or seasoned, like orange juice, lemonade, no, those things will burn the throat, okay? Mm -hmm. Another thing is take that medicine um, that child and have them rest. I have seen one week post tonsillectomy, the clot from the side of their um, tonsils fell off and this kid hemorrhaged almost to the point of coding. She was coming, coming from the doctor's office. She started vomiting with clots, came into the ER and we rushed her to the trauma room. And this little six-year-old girl got a whole liter of normal saline. That's how much blood was coming out of her. So please let them rest for at least a week or so after. Plenty of fluids, but listen, start with a popsicle. Stop, start with some ice, okay? And nothing red. If it's red, how do you know if it's blood, right? Nothing red. And then ice collars. Now the younger kids, they don't want it. The older kids will put it there because they know it hurts, okay? And one of the thing older kids do is about four days post-op, they start getting these ear like hurting. You know, you could yawn and whatnot, but chewing gum helps with this pain, helps it to go away. And the other thing is if you have a kid, cause you don't want to open their mouth, you don't want to look in there, you don't want to disturb the area. No, leave it alone. But if you see them swallowing, swallowing, it's probably bleeding. So um, something to alert the physician about, to tell the parents to uh, call the physician. My kid keeps swallowing. I don't know if something's going on. And of course, they'll have them come in right away. All right, asthma. Well, asthma, many children have it. Many adults have it. Many kids grow out of it. It's basically your bronchus is very hyper responsive to whatever antigen, what's going on. What do you see in asthma? Well, as I said, with croup, it's inspiratory, strider. Asthma is the expiratory. You can get air in, but then it's so small and it traps it. So it's hard to get it out. So it's that expiratory wheeze. And that's why that. So they're frequent coughing. They're wheezing all over the place. And these children um, need to be taken their uh, rescue. 
So when we see these kids looking like this, you know, these kids are going to need to go and get um, either if they don't have the little spacers, get them put on. They help them, even the younger kids, to give their aerosols. Because having a kid sit for a 20-minute aerosol, many won't. You put a spacer, two puffs, let them breathe four times, and they got their medicine. So it works well. And if you can see, these kids end up, they're used to it by now, especially if they have been since a young child. So albuterol is your rescue with a spacer if we need it. Corticosteroids are those not as an IV steroids for acute phases. It's what we take to prevent bronchospasms. We take it morning and night. In children, the name that we usually use is Pulacort, morning and night, and that's the preventative. We use albuterol for rescue. Then we're gonna give them Singular at night. It's like a Claritin for asthma, I call it. It's the way, best way to describe it. And if you see that little kid up top, she's using a peak uh, flow meter. And what she's doing is she's measuring her breath. And if she starts seeing the volume decreasing, something's going on. So maybe they need to increase their albuterols to get that uh, lungs open so they don't go into an asthma attack. So croup, we basically went over it pretty quick. We didn't really go into the treatment. So this is the treatment. So you have a croup, which is the laryngotracheal bronchitis, right? L, L, uh, LTB, okay? and it's barking, and it's that inflammation. Well, in any airway, you're always gonna maintain an airway. That's always gonna be number one. These children, um, you always have to keep them hydrated and fevers, whatever, give them small sips of something, you know, if they're able to breathe. Now, if a kid gets acutely croup and really is coughing, coughing, and you know, has, no ability to drink, of course, that's going to be the kid who gets an IV. This nebulized mist with O2, they're masked, they've got this little moisture going in, the kids love it. They also give aerosols that have epinephrine, just epinephrine in the aerosol chamber, and you put it on, it lasts two or three minutes, but that epinephrine goes right to all that swelling and helps decrease it. And then, of course, steroids, whether it's IM, IV, PO, they're all different ways to handle it, but steroids and epinephrine for those more severe. So this is actually one of those things that has lung sounds. Uh, I couldn't get it working. So, all right. Now, you have croup, it's barking, it's usually worse at night. That's when parents usually go to the hospital, like, I can't stand it. This kid doesn't stop barking. I don't know what to do. Well, the thing with croup, because it's a swelling in the back of the throat, if we allow it to continue and we don't give a steroid, don't treat it, it's going to lead to what we call epiglottitis. Now, what's the epiglottis? That's that leaf-like structure that covers the larynx when you swallow. So food doesn't go into the lungs. Well, I just said it covers the larynx. Well, now I'm telling you it's inflamed. It's got an itis, right? Inflammation. It's covering the larynx. Can I breathe? No. Um, usually you'll see them sitting forward or to the side. They're going to be drooling because they can't swallow. They can't even breathe. You know, and if they talk, it's going to be glug, 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 glug. you can know that the back of their throat is completely obstructed. If you have a kid who has an epiglottis, it is a medical emergency. Make sure you have a tracheostomy tray and an intubation tray close. Because if these kids, if we can't open that quick enough, these kids will have um, a respiratory arrest, okay? So that's the big deal with these kids. Epiglottis, we have to get an airway going. Yes, we're going to give them epinephrine and steroids and all of that. But in the meantime, they're going to try to find a place in position where they're sitting over or whatever, drooling, trying to find a place that they can breathe. Maybe there's a little space left somewhere they can get air. Now, RSV is a common cold for you and me, but for an infant, young child, it's a lot of extra mucus in the airway, and it's a low-grade fever, and these kids don't feel good. And because all this extra 
mucus, they're obligatory nose breathers. They don't know how to breathe through their mouths, so these kids aren't going to eat well. Suck swallowing and breathing with an RSV kid full of mucus, it doesn't work. So we usually, um, with RSV, uh, if you're having those good changing of weather scenes, you'll see it in winter up to early spring. And many children cannot have RSV or a common cold because they're already too sick. Could be a premature child, a cardiac child, could be a cystic fibrosis child, immunosuppressed child. So we give them preventatory monthly, monthly immunizations, usually from winter to spring. It's like about eight, nine months. That's it. Not for a whole year, but eight or nine months. So what are we going to teach these parents? Suction the nose before you eat. Let them eat. Don't over suction. It will create too much extra irritation. And um, of course, try to keep the temperature down. Infectious mononucleosis is caused by uh, Epstein-Barr virus. It's a sore throat. You're going to see, it's called the kissing disease, you know, the teenagers. And it's a virus that makes you feel horrible. Sore throat, fever, rash, your glands are going to be swollen, your liver, your spleen are going to be swollen. And these kids um, usually have gone through a course of antibiotics and have had strep throat exams and flu exams and everything's negative, negative, negative. So finally, they're going to do a mono spot test. And what they're going to find is that it's positive. And these kids have mono. The biggest thing with mononucleosis is make sure that they are not in any contact sports until the pediatrician clears them. I've told my students about a child who came in and we educated him and his father well. Well, one week later, he was out in the Everglades on a trike, fell off on his belly, was airlifted in. I was the primary trauma nurse, of course, and he came in dead on arrival. He had burst his spleen. Very serious. Make sure that these children, that they're resting, um, even uh, roughhousing with their sisters and brothers. And I had six brothers. You better tell my brothers not to be fighting with me and wrestling with me because that was commonplace. But it can cause that spleen to, um, to rupture. Okay, tetralogy of fallow. Most common of all cardiac conditions you are going to see on HESI and on your NCLEX. This is the one. It's a cyanotic uh, heart disease. It's got four things that happens. Well, there is a hole between the ventricles, so a VSD. That pulmonary valve that comes uh, off the right ventricle, there's some sort of stenosis or some skin that likes to cover it and doesn't let blood flow into the lungs. That aorta is going to be pushed over to the right side a little bit. And because sometimes when blood can't go into the lungs, it stretches that right ventricle and it causes right ventricular hypertrophy. That's what that means, a stretching. So these kids have tet spells. What do you do with an infant? I had a tet spell at, it was like four o'clock in the morning. And little Nolan, all I wanted to do was wipe his face off and change his diaper. And he just tet spelled on me and turned from pink to black in 10 seconds. O2 sats of 100 down to 10. So do a knee chest. Now he was on his side. So I took his head and his knees and forced them up to each other. And I had to do it two times. And then the blood came back and the O2 sats went up. Older children who have tetralogy unrepaired will do what that little boy up there is doing. And I don't know why they know it. All of a sudden they'll squat and does the same thing as knee chest. It takes the abdominal pressure, pushes up into the chest, and it forces the blood back into the heart and it pops open whatever is causing that pulmonic valve to be closed. So congenital heart defects, this is the picture from your book. You've seen it in your lecture, um, all about different things. So increased pulmonary blood flow, 
you got a hole in the heart anywhere, it's going to be increased. So between the atrium or ventricle, doesn't matter. And we've learned about what a patent ductus arteriosus is. That is what will keep you oxygenated where nothing else can oxygenate you. And then, of course, we have the obstruction, that coarctation, where you have elevated blood pressure in the uppers and decreased in the lower and you're going to have blood flow going back. You can't go down all of it. So down there, but blood's flowing back into the heart, stretching out the left ventricle, going into the lungs, causing congestive heart failure. And as I said, decreased blood flow, we know that's pulmonary. You know, tricuspid atresia, we don't mention it a lot, but, you know, think about what this is. We have a tricuspid valve, right? Where is it? between the right atrium and right ventricle. There's a valve, but there's an atresia. A means without, that means nothing. There is not a valve there. There's just a spot where they call it. So you're getting no blood into the right ventricle and nothing is going to the heart. Does that make sense to you, atresia? Because that's the one big atresia you see. Stenosis is narrowing, atresia is nothing. And then we have transposition, which we have that PDA to help keep us happy. So <clears throat> as nurses, what are we gonna see? You know, this is like so typical. Infant comes out and all of a sudden, you know, there's a cardiac condition. And we know that because we see a heartbeat that's a little bit higher. They're breathing faster because they're trying to get oxygen around. There's not enough oxygen, they're gonna be trying. You know, as they get older, you're going to see swelling because they can't move the fluid around. Um, you're going to see that. And then, of course, they're going to tire out really easy. You know, you're going to see infants that lose weight because they're hypoxic and they are hypoxic. They have absolutely no energy to feed. So they're going to lose weight. That is a typical cardiac child. You know, um, if you can't breathe, uh, if you're trying to breathe, you have no oxygen, you're, you're not going to. And, and these kids will go to sleep and tire very easily. So there's a couple of these um, little videos here that we have in there for you. So you, know, you can go through them and you can look at them. And they're, they're great little cute little zippets. They're, they're nothing big, okay? Now, patent ductus arteriosus, you know, I mentioned this is where you get oxygen where you can't get oxygen anywhere else. You know, the, there's no connection to the lungs. How do we get oxygen to the body? Well, this is a little duct that's there at birth. It's fetal circulation. It connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery. And what is the function? It helps the heartbeat, okay, so cardiac output, and it causes oxygenation to get where it needs. So it's good for oxygen, and it helps the heart work, because now we get oxygen working around, and it's, it's wonderful. There is this big machine-like murmur that you can hear there. So um, that would be a PDA. Most children, it will close right after birth. So what do we do um, for those children who need to have oxygen and have no other way? Well, transposition of the great arteries is when you have the pulmonic circulation on the aortic side and the aortic on the pulmonic side. Just, it looks like two different circulations. There's no connection between the lungs and the body. So there's something we need to do to get oxygen. Well, I just said, we've got this little duct. So we give prostaglandins. Now prostaglandins is what's normally there from mommy, but after birth, mommy's gone. So we, it's a synthetic thing. We give very slow, continuous infusion and it helps these children oxygenate and it helps the heart pump. And because we're giving oxygen, it prevents a lot of problems in the brains, okay? Because now you got oxygen moving around. As I said, atresia, it is an absence, as I said, like tricuspid atresia. 
And stenosis is a narrowing. You know, a lot of times stenosis is either pulmonic or aortic stenosis, most common of all of them. Now, post-op surgery of cardiac surgery, you're going to have chest tubes. It could be two, three, four chest tubes. And as being an old adult nurse, along with a pediatric nurse, I know they hurt. They burn coming out. Adults tell me they burn. So make sure that if you're taking a chest tube out on a child who's aware, number one, get on their level and tell them what's going to happen. Be honest. Tell them it's going to hurt a little. Make sure you give them whatever pain medicine is available that you give them something. Well, because you're given pain medicine, you take vitals before and you take them after. So be honest with them and get on their level so they really understand. You know, kids, especially cardiac kids, they are chronically in and out of the hospital. You don't want to scare them. So just be honest. Transplants. You know, usually your really cyanotic diseases like your hypoplastic left heart syndromes are the ones that in the end, maybe not as a newborn, but an older child require transplants. The biggest risk is rejection. So hopefully they'll make it. Rheumatic fever. What's rheumatic fever caused by? It's a strep throat that we didn't take care of, right? So that's why we're going to teach our parents to take care, make sure that they administer the entire dose of um, antibiotics. You're going to have fever, joint pain, rash, subcutaneous joint nodules. And the one thing we can't turn around is valve damage. And it's usually mitral valve damage. And then something called chorea, which is a wobbly, wiggly sort of walk. All of that can go away, but you need long-term antibiotics for that. But the heart damage that's there is going to have to be surgically or medically uh, taken care of. Digoxin. Well, how are you going to monitor an infant at home with digoxin or even in the hospital? Um, digoxin side effects, digitoxicity, adults, well, vomiting, right? Nausea, vomiting. I mean, you might see yellow spots as an older person, but a, a young infant can't tell you that. But heart rate, heart rate and vomiting, something's going on. You are going to hold that digoxin, tell the physician, and you're going to get a digoxin level if you're in the hospital. Because toxicity could be as simple as just vomiting. Do not repeat the dose you're going to um, in the hospital. You are going to um, call the doctor and get a some sort of level. Now, cardiac cath. Biggest risk is bleeding. I've always said, first thing I'm doing is checking that bandage because I know how big those catheters are that came out of that groin. So what happens if it's bleeding? You're going to take two fingers. I mean, remember, congenital heart is a lot, a lot of time infants, newborns. This is where you see a lot of them. You take two fingers right above the area of insertion and push down. And of course, you're going to call for help. Um, and you're going to keep it there until the bleeding stops. And then the physician can be there, put another pressure dressing on. Older kids will get a um, some sort of sandbag. Remember these kids, the, the big deal is bleeding. We need to keep that leg straight, bed rest 24 hours, and make sure that they're getting some sort of oral hydration. When they come out of calf, we don't know if they've had sugars or not. So always check their glucose, making sure that their levels aren't too low because we feed them up to about infants about two hours prior to procedure. ITP. Bleeding, P equals platelets, right? This is a child who comes in, who's got his bruising, uh, petechial rash, something that um, parents says, the kid doesn't go outside. Why is this going on? Or they come in because they're having nosebleeds. Doesn't know what's happening. 
Well, these kids are a really, really low platelet counts. And these kids usually get this from an upper respiratory infection. And these kids were gonna have to have um, treatment usually for their, about a year. And it's IVIG and anti-D antibody, sometimes corticosteroids. Now, sickle cell, we give a lot of fluids to dilate the veins in that case. But in ITP, there's no venous anything going on here. It's just this bruising. So we're going to prevent bleeding. So avoid IM injections, IV starts, watch them, their teeth, their urine, their stool, watch for bleeding, monitor their blood counts. And that's the way that we would be treated. If it goes away within the first year, this was only acute. HIV in children, uh, we know that they're born, many of them with it. Um, so we know opportunistic infection of respiratory is your PCP pneumonia. Their GI, mouth to anus could be candida. Um, and those are the two things that we see a lot of the time with HIV and children. And it's just getting on those antivirals and immediately after birth and boosting their immune systems of it. Um, again, HIV is they're growing old. You know, these kids have a virus that's in you know, their immune system is, you know, really non-existent. So just give them good nutritional support and preventing any of these infections. Types of anemia, iron deficient, not enough iron in the diet. What are we going to do? Well, change the diet or we're going to give some sort of iron Remember, iron dextram is deep z track And remember, if they're taking it liquid, it goes through a straw to prevent uh, staining of their teeth. Megoblastic is the intrinsic factor. It's B12. So you don't have enough B12 or folic acid. Um, we can just replace it. Hemolytic anemia, um, that's at GP6. Uh, H, it's the hemolysis of blood cells due to sugar and, and, and medicines that we can give. And it, their cells just burst. We don't really go over that. Sickle cell is a sickle shaped cell. Well, how do we treat sickle cell? IV fluids, heat, let's dilate those vessels. Let's give some um, pain medicine, uh, replace blood, and we're going to give antibiotics if there's a fever going on. Cooley's anemia, Cooley's anemia, which is thalassemia. This is what the child's going to need. Those cells are bursting and quite, you know, quickly after birth. So, and they're producing them regularly, what they should. They keep going and producing. So you have iron in this, the blood. You've got um, all the oxygen is being lost there. So they're hypoxic and they're in chronic um, iron overload. So iron chelation therapy and blood transfusions is what they need. Aplastic anemia is all types of blood. Uh, their white counts, your platelets, your red counts are all low. And literally you have to wipe out their whole system with like a giving them um, chemo like they're in leukemia and then doing a stem cell replant and hopefully the body resets and starts producing the cells that they should. You have a problem with giving blood. There's all things you can see. Remember any reaction, turn it off. Okay. If you see shortness of breath, jugular vein distension, well, there's some extra fluid there. It's going to be a circulatory overload. Again, um, turn it off and get permission to be able to give it. So sickle cell, again, we know it's inherited. Two parents have it, 25% or one in four is going to have sickle cell. We know it has to do with the vessels are too small. You can't get those vessels down there. So you need to, and it hurts. I mean, these kids are crying, they're in so much pain. So get number one priority, an IV and bolus this kid with some fluid, dilate the vessel, give them some heat, dilate the vessel and give them something for pain. Now, this, this slide is all about 
children with cancer. Now remember, not all children with cancer are gonna have low neutrophil counts. There's other reasons for low neutrophil counts. It could be many things. But just to know, if you have a child who has a neutrophil count below 500, this child is at risk for acute sepsis. This kid could go into septic shock and could die. That's how severe low neutrophil counts is. So one of the things you monitor, I mean, yeah, with cancer, yes, but even other kids, that's going to be your priority patient. If you're giving a list of patients, that's the one you, you're going to see first. Leukemia, you just got white blood cells. They're, they're, they're immature. They're not working. They're cancerous. So what we do is we're going to give chemo to these children. Remember, the first part of it is induction. And what's that mean is the first four to six weeks of the chemotherapy. And we hit this kid with all sorts of chemo. And our goal is remission, right? Then we're going to put do an intrathecal, get the central nervous system, and then we'll just put them on like a prophylactic because there's going to be a couple cells in there somewhere hiding. And we're going to try to get them out so that we can put them in full remission. Always antimetics, give it before because you get really nauseous. Osteosarcoma, bone tumor. It could be humerus, it could be femur. Most of the time I see femur, okay? Now remember, you can't just take out a piece of the femur. You have to take the whole thing. That whole bone must go. So they're left if you take the whole leg off with no leg. So what they try to do is salvage the bottom part of their leg and put it up into the hip. And what that allows this child is a place to put a prosthesis. So they'll be able to move around. All right, with leukemia, one of the, the um, cures is giving a uh, stem cell transplant. There's two types, and this is how I tell my class to remember. If I'm getting a stem cell or a bone marrow transplant, I want autologous, means automatically me, it's mine. Automatic, yeah, that's what I want. Now, if I haven't saved my cells, or, you know, sometimes it's going to be your cord blood that parents save for you, that'd be an autologous one for that child. Then the second choice is the allogenic. And allo means all, and it means everybody else. And that's how I remember them, who is what transplant. Autologous comes from me, allogenic, all, everybody else um, would be giving me that transplant. And remember, there is no blood types when it comes to this at all. Brain tumors, what do you see? Well, these is the most common of all solid tumors in children. What we're going to see is a kid who has headaches, maybe vomiting, not related to eating, and it gets worse and worse. So it's progression of disease gets really bad. Uh, when we see that, then they're going to go start looking, x-rays, CAT scans, et cetera. And then Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Well, Hodgkin's is from the shoulders up, and you see these big, big lymph nodes. And this is um, the one that we see these big lymph nodes, and they don't hurt at all. Okay, the parent is like, why don't these hurt? These look like they're painful, but it pushes on the trachea, so it causes this cough, right? That's where that irritation comes, what that cough comes from. Not Hodgkin's is all over the place and really hard to see, okay? So Hodgkin's, poof, it's out there. I can see it, these non-painful, non-tender um, nodes, and again, above the, the shoulders. And non-Hodgkin's is all over the place, non-diffuse. And there it goes into all of the things, again, localized and then everywhere else. CPR, children. Well, we know if we are there alone that you need to do chest CPT and then call 911, all right? That's what we do um, with just basic CPR. We've all taken it. Remember, there's a parent there too, okay? And that 
if you are in the hospital setting that somebody takes care of those poor parents. Now you're gonna see five dosage calculations. You have mics per kilo, you have a heparin question again, you have an IV mLs per hour. So if you need any help with dosage cal, you've got my video, all of you do, no excuses. I think I said it on week two, if I'm not mistaken, in Canvas. And it's there for you with the worksheets. If you need help with them, done bad with math, let me know and I'm here to help you. Any questions? We did it, yay. Good luck to everybody, I wish you all the best.